Hello, and welcome to another episode of Weird and Wonderful History. I'm your host, Celestial Chronicles, and today I'm going to tell you about some of the most bizarre and fascinating facts from the past that you probably never learned in school. Trust me, these are not your typical textbook stories. These are the kind of stories that will make you say, wow, I can't believe that actually happened. So, buckle up and get ready for a wild ride through history. Let's start with a war that lasted for over three centuries, but had no casualties, no battles, and no real reason to exist. I'm talking about the Dutch Silly War, which spanned from 1651 to 1986. Yes, you heard that right, 1986. That's longer than the United States has been a country. How did this happen, you ask? Well, it all began during the English Civil War, when the Dutch sided with the parliamentarians against the royalists. The royalists, being sore losers, decided to raid some Dutch ships before fleeing to the Isles of Scilly, a small archipelago off the coast of Cornwall. The Dutch, being understandably annoyed, demanded compensation from the royalists, but they refused to pay up. So, the Dutch declared war on the Isles of Scilly, hoping to force them to cough up the money. But, there was a slight problem. The royalists had no money. They were broke. So, the Dutch realized that there was no point in fighting a war that they couldn't win, and decided to just leave. But, they forgot one important detail. They never signed a peace treaty with the Isles of Scilly. They just assumed that the war was over, and moved on with their lives. And so did the people of Scilly, who had no idea that they were technically at war with the Dutch for the next 335 years. The war remained a forgotten footnote in history, until 1985, when a historian named Roy Duncan stumbled upon it while researching the history of Scilly. He thought it was hilarious, and decided to invite the Dutch ambassador to Scilly to sign a peace treaty and end the war once and for all. The ambassador agreed, and on April 17, 1986, the two parties met at the council chamber of St. Mary's, the largest island of Scilly, and signed a document that officially ended the longest and most peaceful war in history. The ambassador joked that it must have been awfully expensive to keep the war going for so long, and that he hoped that the Salonians would not harbor any hard feelings towards the Dutch. The Salonians, of course, had no clue what he was talking about, but they played along and accepted his apology. And thus, the Dutch Silly War came to a peaceful and amicable conclusion, after 335 years of absolutely nothing happening. Now, let's move on to a more recent war, World War II, and a more familiar food, hamburgers. You probably know that hamburgers are one of the most popular and iconic American foods, right? Well, did you know that during World War II, Americans didn't call them hamburgers? They called them Liberty Steaks. Why? Because, hamburger, sounded too German, and the Americans didn't want to be associated with their enemies. So, they renamed the dish to something more patriotic and less offensive. And this wasn't the first time they did this. During World War I, another food that had a German name, sauerkraut, was rebranded as Liberty Cabbage. Because, you know, nothing says freedom like fermented cabbage. And it wasn't just food that got a makeover. German Shepherd Dogs were called Liberty Hounds, German Measles were called Liberty Measles, and Dachshunds were called Liberty Pups. Because, apparently, even dogs and diseases can be traitors. But, don't worry, after the wars were over, the Americans went back to calling these things by their original names, and no one seemed to mind. Except maybe the Germans, who probably wondered why the Americans were so obsessed with their food and animals. Speaking of weapons, let's talk about one of the most common and deadly types of ammunition in the world, the 7.62mm rifle bullet. You may have heard of this bullet before, because it's the one that AK-47 assault rifles use. And you may have seen AK-47S before, because they're the most widely used and distributed rifles in the world. They're cheap, reliable, and easy to use, which makes them popular among soldiers, rebels, terrorists, and criminals alike. But, did you know that the 7.62mm bullet was created over a century ago, by the Russian Empire? That's right, this bullet dates back to 1891, when it was designed for the Mosin-Nagant bolt-action rifle, a weapon that was used by the Russian army in both world wars, and many other conflicts. The bullet was so effective and versatile, that it was adopted by many other countries and weapons, including the AK-47, which was invented in 1947 by Mikhail Kalashnikov, a Soviet soldier and engineer. The AK-47, and the 7.62mm bullet, became symbols of the Cold War, and the spread of communism around the world. Today, the 7.62mm bullet is still in use, and is one of the most widely available and recognizable types of firearm ammunition in history. It's also one of the most lethal, as it can penetrate body armor, walls, and even light vehicles. So, next time you see an AK-47, remember that it's firing a bullet that's older than your grandparents. Now, let's go back to the 18th century, and meet some of the most unlikely and exotic visitors to Britain, the Native American leaders. 
in 1710, for Mohawk kings from one of the Iroquois Confederacy's five nations, and one Algonquian chief from the Mahican tribe, traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to meet with Queen Anne, the ruler of Great Britain. This was a very rare and remarkable event, as it was the first time that Native Americans had visited Britain as diplomats, and not as captives or curiosities. The Native Americans were part of a delegation that was sent by the British colonists in North America, who wanted to secure the alliance and support of the Iroquois against the French and their native allies. The Iroquois were a powerful and influential confederation of six nations, who controlled a large territory in what is now New York, Pennsylvania, and Ontario. They had a complex and sophisticated political system, and a long history of trade and warfare with the Europeans. The British colonists hoped that by bringing the Iroquois leaders to Britain, they would impress them with their wealth and power, and convince them to join their side in the colonial wars. The Native Americans, on the other hand, hoped that by meeting with the Queen, they would gain her respect and protection, and secure their rights and lands against the encroaching colonists. The Native Americans arrived in London in April 1710, and were greeted with great curiosity and admiration by the public. They were transported through the streets in royal carriages, and were personally met by Queen and at the court of St. James Palace. They also visited the Tower of London, where they saw the crown jewels, and St. Paul's Cathedral, where they attended a service. They were treated with high honor and dignity, and were given gifts and medals by the Queen. They also gave speeches and performed dances for the Queen and her court, and expressed their desire for peace and friendship between their peoples. The Queen was impressed by their eloquence and grace, and promised to help them in their struggles against the French and their allies. She also agreed to send missionaries and teachers to their lands, to instruct them in the Christian faith and the English language. The Native Americans were satisfied with the Queen's response, and thanked her for her kindness and generosity. They also expressed their hope that they would see her again, and invited her to visit their lands. The Queen, however, declined the invitation, as she was too busy and too ill to travel. The Native Americans stayed in London for about two months, and then returned to their homes, with a new sense of respect and admiration for the British. They also left a lasting impression on the British, who were fascinated by their culture and appearance. The Native Americans were immortalized in paintings, prints, and poems, and became celebrities in their own right. Their visit was one of the most remarkable and memorable events in the history of cross-cultural contact, and a rare example of mutual understanding and appreciation between two very different worlds. And finally, let's end with a sweet and juicy story, about one of the most delicious and coveted fruits in history, the pineapple. You may think that pineapples are just a common and ordinary fruit, that you can find in any supermarket or grocery store. But, did you know that in the 18th century, pineapples were a status symbol, that only the rich and powerful could afford and enjoy? That's because pineapples were not native to Europe, but to South America, where they were cultivated by the indigenous peoples for thousands of years. The Europeans first encountered pineapples in the 15th century, when Christopher Columbus and his crew landed in the Caribbean, and tasted the fruit for the first time. They were amazed by its sweet and tangy flavor, and its spiky and exotic appearance. They brought some pineapples back to Europe, where they caused a sensation among the nobility and the royalty, who considered them a rare and precious delicacy. But, there was a catch. Pineapples were very hard to grow in Europe, because they required a tropical climate and a lot of care and attention. They were also very expensive to import from the colonies, because they were fragile and perishable. So, only the wealthiest and most powerful people could afford to buy or grow pineapples, and they used them as a way to show off their status and taste. They would display them in their homes, gardens, and parties, and sometimes even carry them around as accessories. They would also decorate their clothes, furniture, and buildings with pineapple motifs, to signify their wealth and prestige. And, for those who were not rich enough to own a pineapple, but still wanted to join the craze, they could rent a pineapple for a day, and pretend to be part of the elite. Pineapples became so popular and coveted, that they were sometimes stolen, smuggled, or counterfeited, by people who wanted to get a taste of the exotic fruit. Pineapples were also seen as a symbol of hospitality and generosity, because they were often given as gifts or served as desserts to guests. They were considered a rare and special treat, that could impress and delight anyone who tasted them. Pineapples were also believed to have medicinal and aphrodisiac properties, which added to their appeal and mystique. Pineapples were, in short, the ultimate luxury and status symbol of the 18th century, and a fruit that everyone wanted to have and enjoy. And that's it for today's episode of Weird and Wonderful History. I hope you enjoyed learning about some of the most amazing and unbelievable facts from the past, and that you found them as interesting and entertaining as I did. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. And, if you have any suggestions or requests for future topics, 
please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you and see what you want me to talk about next. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time on Weird and Wonderful History.